Три. Два. Один. In this video series we are going to explore all the commonly presented evidences to prove that the Apollo missions were a hoax. However, there are a lot of misconceptions surrounding this topic, so our job will be to separate the weak evidences from the solid evidences, or what we like to call, the real smoking guns, from the not so smoking guns. So join us now on this adventure, as we go into the lies which NASA has told, in order to cover up the truth which they are trying to hide from us. Hello everyone, welcome to another video on the Apollo Moon hoax. Today I have an interesting guest. His name is Dr. Raza Farhari. And I've been watching some of his work and he's got some interesting perspectives on a lot of things, including the Apollo Moon hoax, which we're obviously going to get into today. And we might just sort of get into some other areas. What we're actually going to do is something a little bit different here. So we both connected recently. And uh, we've been sort of uh, monitoring each other's work and we're going to talk about our respective work. So what I'd like to do first is to hand this over to Dr. Raza Fahari here and ask him to maybe give a little bit of a brief background, say hello to my audience, and we'll go from there. Dr. Raza Fahari. Okay, thanks for having me. And let me just say that before I talk about myself, let me just say that I am not an important person, and you are not an important person. I see this whole world like a battleground, and we're all just here for a very short time. So, you know, there's a giant tidal wave of the public consciousness is being guided in a certain way, and I'm just trying to throw little pebbles and make little ripples, you know, like trying to throw a monkey wrench in this big... Uh, war machine you know and what can i do you know but anyway i just try so that's important in one of my recent interviews somebody asked me why are you doing this why are you blowing the whistle and really the answer to this question is because i really want to try to stop world war three <laughs> yeah and there's a lot of force behind that right now They've been planning this for a long time. They have this, what they call the new axis of evil, which is Russia, China, and Iran, you know. So I hope that some people will listen to what I have to say and have a new way of looking at this situation. No, very good points. I mean, I think we were both in sync on that issue. I mean, I agree with you that there seems to be a mass awakening happening. This is as, almost as if, if we can use the analogy of consciousness rising. And where in history, this used to happen more on a local level or it would be specific to one country or maybe two countries. But now we're seeing this globally. I agree with you. I can't think of any better reason to be doing this than to prevent World War III. And that is getting a lot of people's attention. And I agree with you too. And when you said, you know, we're not so much significant as we're part of the greater good, the greater whole, trying to get the message out and trying to convey to people that, you know, what some of us that have been saying for the last, you know, several decades has actually come to fruition now. It's actually come out in the open. And I think a lot of people are now realizing that and hence be saying now that go to your local conspiracy theorists if you want to actually get an answer. So this for me now is not so much a conspiracy theory as it's becoming conspiracy fact. So yeah, no, so there's a lot to talk about here. So I was just wondering if you could just give the viewers a little bit of your background. I think they'd be really interested in briefly and who it is that they're watching here. Well, to put it very simply is actually I was a World War I, World War II historian who was forced into the role of an Apollo historian. <laughs> For many years, that was my big thing. I spent so many years studying that. And, you know, I've been studying the moon landing off and on for, you know, more than 20 years. It wasn't that big of a deal for me. I was more into other subjects. But then, you know, my Facebook group went viral. And so that's become full time work now you know i'm constantly have to answer people's questions you know people asking me well what does the official story say about this and what does the official story say about that one of the things i'm trying to do here is i'm trying to help people 
present a better argument. I created what I call two different categories. One we call the smoking guns, and the other category is the things which make you go, hmm. Yeah. So there's a big difference between that. Fortunately, the other admin for my group is actually a lawyer in America, and he's been giving me advice. We're actually maybe even considering presenting a case someday against NASA. So basically what it boils down to is this. You have certain questions like, did the Apollo crafts have enough battery power? Did they have enough oxygen? And these kind of questions are things that make you go, hmm, because but you can't really come up with a definite answer because it's like you only have NASA documents to go by and you can't prove whether it's right or wrong. So in a court of law, if NASA was forced to prove they actually went to the moon, there's two kinds of evidence. One you call hearsay evidence and one is actual physical evidence, right? So yes, we flew around the Van Allen belt. This is hearsay evidence, you know, NASA said it happened, so that happens. No, that doesn't work in a court of law. So what is the actual physical evidence is basically you have the photos and the videos. They have presented to us certain photos and certain videos, and this is our proof that we went to the moon. This is where the smoking guns lie. If you can find errors in the photos and video records, then this is the real smoking guns. So this is what I try to educate my group members about. I've been running this Facebook group since 2008, okay, <laughs> when Facebook just began, and they've shut me down several times. But, you know, I kept making new groups, and I think the latest incarnation has been there since 2011, maybe. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, now we have over 42,000 members, you know, so it's, uh, That's it's good. very interesting. From 2008 until 2020, we only had 1,000 members. And then all of a sudden, in the last two years, it went viral from like 1,000 to 42,000. So, you know, I've been kind of focusing a lot of time on that and trying to help people to present a better case, make a stronger argument. I want to touch on one point that you mentioned just earlier in terms of NASA documents. I know that our moon hoax community has done a lot of work, you included, on the photo and film record of the Apollo mission. That's something I've stayed away from because I just don't have a lot of experience when it comes to that. So I've gone into other areas. But the contribution that yourself and others, like, for example, uh, Marcus Allen and Scott Henderson and, of course, Robert Williams, you know, he has done some very excellent work and some experiments in that. But when you mentioned NASA documents, and interestingly enough, you mentioned presenting them or talking about them or as evidence based in a court of law, I've noticed that some of these documents are constantly being updated. It's not like no longer an historical record because it's now become an historical fiction because they keep updating these records. And I know when it comes to the photographic and film record, that's constantly being updated. It's almost laughable that you just can't trust the photographic and film record anymore. And when people, more people realize that, and they ask NASA, well, wait a minute, why are you constantly changing this or updating that or colorizing this? And did these photos even exist 40 years ago? I mean, a lot of these photos that we're aware of now came out with the advent of the internet in the uh, mid to late 1990s. So I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit on that, because I always find that a very interesting point, even though I don't focus on it myself, but I certainly do see the uh, value in that research. Well, let's start off by saying that I first heard that the theory that it was a hoax in 2001. When I first heard that theory, First thing I did is I went to the NASA webpage and started downloading as many images and videos as I could. And as you know, 2001 was when the Bart Sabrell's video came out and a lot of people all over the world started waking up around that same time. And so NASA realized, uh-oh, we've got to do some damage control here. So what they did between 2001 and 2009, 
they did a massive Photoshop effort. They knew that the images on their web pages were full of problems. And so they started taking them off the web page and Photoshopping them. And in the year 2010, they uploaded a whole new set of images. 10,000 images, all new, all Photoshopped. Some of the main things they were concerned about is the uneven lighting on the ground. And they used Photoshop to fix all that. And now they're going to try to claim, well, these were the original images. <laughs> but they're not the original images. So one of the missions I'm on, and I'm trying to get other people to help me on this, we can actually prove which images are first <laughs> by finding them on Internet Archives. So if you go to Internet Archives and you type in, you know, AS11, and then you'll get all the Apollo 11 images, and you'll see some images where the background is uneven lighting, and you'll see some images with the background even lighting. And every image with the uneven lighting is pre-2010, and every image with the even background lighting is 2010 beyond. You know, so with Internet Archive, you can have evidence that this photo was uploaded on this date and this photo was uploaded on this date. So we could actually prove it in a court of law that these are the original photos. These are the ones with the uneven backlighting and these ones with the even backlighting came later, you know, and yeah. Internet Archives proves the exact date. I've found dozens and dozens of examples of we can prove where they have photoshopped it. And, you know, I'm trying to get other people involved in this, you know, like help me look through Internet Archives. <laughs> there has been talk about them actually trying to shut down Internet Archives. And I think what is actually happening <coughs> is that company is in need of money. So I think they're under pressure now. They're asking for donations now because they're not getting the support they used to get. <laughs> that could be one of the reasons now NASA realizes that we can actually prove which were the original images by using Internet Archives. <laughs> <laughs> you see, that's the thing. That's the thing that really amazes me. It's interesting to look at one photo or one film and then say, yeah, the lighting is not right there. It's not right over there. And I know Barca Brill's done some good work on that too. But when you look at the bigger picture, and as you just pointed out, to the average person out there who may not be familiar with the details of what we're talking about when it comes to the Apollo Moon Mission hoax, when you look at the bigger picture, people who are not aware of you know, the fact that it was hoax will be asking themselves, okay, that's a good point. Why are they updating the whole catalog, like why are they constantly doing that? That is a very valid question. And I, I just wrote down another interesting point here because I was thinking about this when you were talking here and you make a very convincing case. And I could see this in a court of law that these photos are definitely fake photoshopped, fake phony and false, whatever you want to call it. But then you also have the proponents of the missions will come along and say, okay, we agree with you the photographic and film record is faked, but that doesn't mean they didn't go. I'm sure you've heard that argument. I, uh, what do you say to that? It's part of a psyop, you know, there's all these psyops like, oh, we filmed it just in case we couldn't make it, but then we didn't have to use that. We went, but we encountered aliens, so that's why we presented fake film. Ah, this is These are all psyops, same as flat earth, you know. So anyway, <laughs> I wanted to mention one more thing coming back to this, because I just spoke about the images, the photos, how they were all photoshopped. Most people have seen the American Moon movie, and they did a great job of talking about making sure you use the original videos. That right. would be the spacecraft film videos. <clears throat> and many people have those original videos and many people are uploading them to YouTube. But if you go to the actual NASA webpage, like Apollo Lunar Surface Journal, and you see what videos they have up now, they're actually trying to hide some of their bloopers. And I have found two bloopers, which NASA is hiding from their webpage, 
but you can still find them on the spacecraft films videos. So this is, you know, American Moon does a good job. Make sure you use the spacecraft films videos because those are the original unedited ones. There used to be an American Moon blog, you know, where he was discussing things like, and there was a battle going on where he actually busted them editing the audio in order to get rid of the missing gaps. You know, there has to be this three second gap, right? The camera's running, Joe. Okay, and standing by for a mark from your pre-roll. Okay, Joe, you got a Dave, you're one of trans for uh, the, or course three four six, and it's about one point seven clicks the station. Okay. I'm gonna go down sort of slow here, Joe. Just make sure we uh, play it cool. Well, I just have the camera running, Joe. Remind me to turn it off when it runs out of film. Yes, sir. I've got a hand. About half a mag on him. Roger. And you're running at uh, 12 frames per second, I imagine. Yeah. Right. We're going down south. Down south, they're going to be very good on the photography, Joe. The, the zero phase just washes out completely. No problem, Dave. Uh, Jim might want to swing the camera around or to the right. Well, we're heading directly downhill now. We're cropped up. NASA actually tried to edit in some of those gaps and the American moon were busting them in that. I think that blog is completely gone now. I haven't been able to find it in many years. I'm still carrying on all that work myself. I'm comparing what I find on the spacecraft films to what is on the NASA webpage now. And there's a couple bloopers which they are specifically trying to hide. And one of them, is when he jumps up and tries to grab the ladder and misses the ladder and he's dangling in the air. Like NASA has cut that video right after he jumps and then you can't find the part two yeah. <laughs> where he's dangling in the air. But yeah. you can find it on spacecraft film. The other blooper, which they're trying to hide, it's not on the NASA webpage anymore, is the docking scene from Apollo 12. And that's when the the LEM is coming back to the command module and the LEM is turning and the radar dish flops down in the earth gravity. Okay, this is a big blooper and now they're hiding it. You can't even go to the NASA webpage to find this Apollo 12 docking scene anymore. But if you get the spacecraft films, you can find the original one and it shows the, the big bloopers here and they're, they know it and they're trying to hide it. When you're talking there, lots of points come up here, and I keep going back and remembering what people, proponents would throw at you or proponents would ask of you. And I know you've talked about this in the Apollo Detectives video series, and others have talked about it too. When we point out, you know, no stars in the sky from the lunar surface, so on and so forth, uh, you see very little star patterns in the photos, in fact, none at all. And, you know, it, it really amazes me that, well, people say, well, but it wouldn't show up or it wouldn't do this. And they didn't, you know, they didn't have the right photographic equipment to film or to photograph these star patterns in the sky from the lunar surface. And I've always asked the question, I've always sort of given them the benefit of the doubt when it comes to that and say, okay, that, that's, a, that's a fair statement. But with the billions of dollars that was invested in these so-called missions, could they not have afforded a few hundred dollars to bring a camera specifically for they, that very purpose? They, they did. There's, a, I think it's Apollo 16. If you search for the what's called the UV camera, the official story is we brought a special camera <clears throat> which was able to pick up stars and they were able to snap one photograph of supposedly the Earth and the stars which you could supposedly see around the Earth at that time. I've actually done a lot of research on this. First of all, the Earth looks totally fake. You know, 
It's like you see the earth and you see some stars around it. I don't even know what kind of excuse they're giving for that. It's like there's two bright lights like streaking across the earth and they don't try to give an excuse. It just looks totally fake. Like I say, most people still believe the NASA story. So they look at that and say, oh, yes, there's the earth and there's the stars around it. And in one of the NASA images, they actually labeled the stars around that. So I actually did some research on this. Would you actually be able to see those stars at that landing point on that exact day? Would the angle of the Earth and the moon, in order to research this, you have to look at the lunar phase, you know, what phase the moon was in when they supposedly took that photo. And that tells you what is the relationship of the sun, the moon, and Earth, right? Yep. There's always a triangle then you can calculate, okay, if the moon is here and the earth is there, it would be the opposite of the zodiac sign, right? So I actually did some research on that, and I took their labeled photo, and they actually have the wrong zodiacs in the background of the earth. You wouldn't be able to see those zodiacs from where the moon was at at that particular date, you know? So anyhow, this is much deeper and you're talking about the ultraviolet photos on Apollo 16. I'm, I'm actually aware of that. I've looked at some of those photos, and they're everything you described them to be. And the Earth itself, yeah, it just doesn't make sense. I can't explain it. You could actually say that it was carelessly photoshopped. I mean, it was pretty sloppy the way it was yeah. done. But the question I wanted to ask you is, and I've had astronomers say this to me, and I've always sort of come back with sort of a pat answer, but just for argument's sake, let's say that the photo pattern is correct, okay? Just let's say it's correct, just for argument's sake. And they said, well, what difference would it make? You wouldn't be able to tell where the photos came from the surface of the moon or it came from the command module in lunar orbit. Now, I don't think that's true. An astronomer worth his weight in gold would be able to decipher, would be able to determine exactly or what position those photos were taken from. Am I correct on that? Yes, of course. Let me give another example to clarify this. If you look at the AS photos. Those are the ones taken with the Hasselblad cameras, AS11 dash da 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 to <clears throat> AS17. So there's roughly 10,000 photos. If you look at the entire photos from start to finish, there's roughly 10,000. And I've looked through all of them. As an astronomer myself, that was the first thing I was looking for. Is the sun and the earth in the right position? Yeah. according to where the moon would be. So what we do is we look at the <clears throat> longitude and the latitude of the claimed landing site. So the longitude of the landing site tells you how high the earth and the sun should be in the lunar sky. Because you're standing on this point in the moon, the earth is at this angle and the sun is at that angle, right? Yeah. And then the latitude would tell you that if you're standing on the Earth's equator, the crescent moon is like this, and the more north you go, it's like that, and the more south you go, it's like that. So the same thing on the moon, we can calculate the crescent moon, the crescent Earth from the lunar surface. So all these things can be done according to the longitude, latitude, and the exact date of the landing, you know. So we can calculate all these things. And I actually did that, you know. I've looked at thousands of photos and calculated is the earth in the right place, is the sun in the right place, is the crescent. And actually, NASA did an extremely good job. They must have had a special team assigned just for that. Make sure that according to this landing site at this time, the earth will be in what position. So they actually did an extremely good job of faking these things. But I did find some mistakes, only a few of them though out of you know thousands and thousands of images. I mean, I literally looked at thousands and thousands of images of the Earth and the moon, like the ship going on the way to the moon and the ship coming back to the Earth. And you know, I've looked at thousands and thousands of images. Is the moon in the right position? Is the Earth in the right position? And I have found mistakes in that. This kind of evidence is normally way over people's head. You know, it's like, People in my group are asking me questions like, uh, why is the flag waving? It's like, you know, these are things which make you go, hmm, okay, like maybe 
NASA saying his hand is on the pole and that makes a flag. But this is kind of a silly arguments. For me, I want absolute proof of a hoax. And I'm going to look at the photos. Where is the sun and where is the moon? Is it in the right place? Yeah. And if you can prove it's in the wrong place, this is absolute proof of a hoax, you know. And that's a good point, because when you mentioned the waving flag and there's some other things, too, like I find that the proponents who speak, take it upon themselves to speak for NASA, and so I'm talking about a specific group here, they have ready answers for all of these questions. And it's almost like it's a red herring, you know, when you're talking about this subject, they already have a script and they're reading from that script yeah. and the waving flag and so and so on and so forth. What I find very interesting is that when you're talking about the juxtaposition of the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, and that's also in relation to the stars, and when you find an anomaly in that, I immediately thought when you were talking about this navigation, because that factors into navigation, and navigation from here to the Moon, 240,000 miles and back, needs to be absolutely precise. It cannot be off by even 0 0.01 degree. It has to be very precise. And if you're finding anomalies in terms of the photos that are presented to you, presented to us from the Apollo missions, then that also factors into, well, if, if there's an anomaly in terms of their position and what they claim their position was, would that not factor into navigation and then throw off their navigational calculations? I mean, there's all kinds of ramifications from this. As far as I'm concerned, you see, uh according to the official story is that the command module and the LEM, okay, they had the human beings supposedly could steer the craft, but the craft <laughs> was also autopilot, you know, basically if there was guys in the craft, they could have just done the whole mission on autopilot, you know, r manually controlled from Houston. You know, you didn't actually need people on board to grab the steering wheel. That's kind of a, a thing that a lot of people don't know. You know, all this stuff about, oh, we had a periscope to look for the skies and a star chart. That was totally unnecessary. It was just for show. You know, regarding navigation, you know, it's like mathematics will plot out the entire course, more or less. See, that's where you have to make course corrections because mathematics can get you 90 maybe even 99% of the way there. But along the way, you have to get the radar to check if you're in the right position. And if you're not, you do a course correction. So this is all basic math, you know. So this I don't really see, as far as navigation goes, it's not a, a question really. So when I was looking into that, and I'm aware that they had to do course corrections, and, you know, and I'm aware of the mathematics that are involved. I, I'm assuming that would have been done through computer programming and what abilities they had back then anyway. And, and, and of course, they've had to have, you know, manual inputs as well. And that's the thing that I found a bit alarming in my own research is when I found that they were actually having to do manual inputs. Like, for example, as you mentioned earlier, the sextant that they were looking through, the optics, and they would coordinate or triangulate between two stars and then their position. And that would be done two or three times during the mission. I really had a problem with that because star patterns are used for navigation. I mean, that's a given. But you would expect all of that to be programmed into a computer. Now, some of it they claim was, but a lot of it required manual intervention and instructions from Houston, they would send up coordinates and then they would tell them to punch this into the Apollo guidance computer. And I kind of found that a bit of a precarious way to navigate that distance. I don't know what your thoughts on that, but that sort of was a bit of a red flag for me. For me, these kind of questions about the ship or the <clears throat> navigation, these come into this category of things which make you go, hmm. Right? Yeah. That's what I consider these kind of things, you know. Did they have enough fuel on board the ship? Would they have been able to navigate? I don't know, you know, because this is, you only have NASA documents, what you call the fox which guards the hen house. Of course, the fox is going to tell you all the hens are fine. Let me just say here, within mission control, you have the front room and you have all the back rooms. And in all the back rooms, the people were watching monitors and they were, all the information they were being fed was coming from the front room, right? So the people in the back rooms had no idea what was really going on. They just saw what they saw on their computer screens. For example, in the front room, 
they could say, okay, now he's coming down the ladder and his heartbeat is elevated. So the people in the back room, they would be watching the heartbeat machine and yes, his heartbeat is elevating. But that elevated heartbeat was just being fed to them from the front room. The whole thing was just a script, you know. They had yeah. written out every step of the journey. On <laughs> Apollo 13, the oxygen tank is going to blow up. This whole thing was scripted out. And the guys are just reading their parts. And only the people in the front room knew. And in the back room, you know, they're freaking out because they thought it was real, you know. <laughs> you know, so this is how they pulled it off. <laughs>